Hey, hello everybody and uh, welcome to another Top Tier Meeting Doctors uh, series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you that are taking the time to be with us. And uh, with me as always, my uh, co-author on Beyond Fitful Meetings, Martin Duffy. Afternoon all. And Martin is reaching us uh, from a, 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 a physical scenario, not uh, his own uh, office, whether he normally reaches us. I'm at my own office here. And with us here mm -hmm. today, we're going to have hopefully uh, more, more guest speakers than John Salens. They are preparing uh, in the studio to join us. And uh, Joan, so pleased to have you here with us. Thank you. Perhaps you'd like to do a, a, a short introduction in order to our viewers to uh, understand who you are. And, and then uh, I'll bring also Steve Bather to the studio and uh, you will invite him to do the same. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Good to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. I was actually in the background and hearing you and I had to move office and set myself up. So uh, sorry to be absolutely on time as opposed to early, which is normal. No problem, Steve. And uh, it's flexible. We are mutual all. And uh, Joanne, yes, if you can a little bit share a little bit about yourself and then Steve and then we'll go on to the, to the, to the chat. As I'm sure this is a fascinating subject for many of our viewers today. Great. Um, my name is Joanne Sands. I'm a Belgian based in Brussels and running a company which is called Synthetron. And we have like almost 15 years of experience in online crowdsource dialogues. So we work in this online big meeting where uh, synchronous from 9 to 10, uh, 10 to 1,000 people actually discuss together. Uh, around key questions moderated by a, a, a facilitator. Uh, these dialogues are anonymous, so it's a lot of the, the things which actually is, is coming into online meetings is there. Anonymous and written uh, and very interactive. At the end, you have the short list of what people find most important. So uh, I, I come from almost, we started online uh, we built the whole service business around it, and now we've, we're actually in the third move of uh, making the tool available more and more to more and more people. Um, that's who I am, and that's the experience I bring. <laughs> Fantastic! Thank you so much, Joanne, for your uh, introduction. Steve, up yes. To you now. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so I've been working as a facilitator, designing and running uh, all sorts of uh, different meetings, conferences, project groups and so on for the past 30 years, I think. I've lost count now. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my specialisms, my real interest has been collaboration technology. So I know Synthetron well. Uh, and uh, absolutely get the power of anonymity and the uh, opportunity to use different technologies in order to free up uh, so people can have a transparent and open conversation, which from my perspective allows them to make better, higher quality decisions. Mm -hmm. um, my particular areas of interest are in uh, climate uh, so I'm working at the moment with COP26, looking at uh, sharing uh, resilience and adaptability research from across the world and trying to get that going and making good decisions about where the investment should go and so on. Uh, I'm also working in safeguarding, so vulnerable children and adults and how the authorities and the multi-agencies that look after the most vulnerable in our society make good decisions and also learn from their experiences. And just very briefly, the last 18 months has been a little bit of a nirvana for me <laughs> because I have been uh, looking at and pushing and developing techniques for online working for a long time, working with Paul and uh, others. Peter Beck, uh, it'd be great if he was going to make it today. Um, <clears throat> I know Martin as well from the past. So the opportunity, I think, for um, us to accelerate our learning and get more from online has just come alive uh, <clears throat> last March, a year last March, when it became a must have and not a nice to have. Um, and I'm also very well aware that the 
uh, enforced behavior change that a lot of us went through in designing and running events has now become habitual to the point where virtual online has become a real and realistic option when you're mm-hmm. thinking about how to work with a group of people, perhaps geographically distributed, uh, perhaps you know in the same country, uh, but perhaps not. So real fantastic opportunity and a massive learning curve in the last 18 months, which uh, you know I'm hoping to bring some of here today. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, Stephen. I have, I have, I have, I'm, I'm, I have a couple of questions to pose you in the meantime, and of course, but uh, the floor to you, Martin. As uh, perhaps you would like to set the background for this, um, for the contest, and also a little bit of your stake in this subject. Yeah, I, I suppose the, uh, the the whole concept of the organization workflows. Uh, very often, it seems to me, just from my own experience, that we we tend to dissociate meetings from workflow. We tend to see meetings as standalone events. There's something, they have a start time, they have an end time, they have a fixed agenda, they have a fixed number of people attending. Um, and, and we thought it might be interesting just to explore a little bit more the holistic nature of meetings as they occur within the organization's overall workflows. Um, and, and we thought maybe out of that conversation, we might get a different understanding or a different appreciation of what meetings actually are. Um, so that, that's, I suppose, where, where our initial thinking was. Um, I'd welcome any initial comments or observations or reactions to that proposition. Absolutely. By alphabetical order, it will be Joanne, the first to take the floor now, but um, it's a fireside chat, so anyone can jump in any time. Jump in, yeah, for sure. Do so you want me to share? Um, OK. Um, Actually, we, we actually think in three phases every time when we talk to a client is um, what is it actually that the client is trying to solve? Why is he meeting people? Why is he listening to people? And uh, it's either because he or she wants input in a decision before it. It's either because there is a decision there, but not sure actually whether it's actually being absorbed or being used and people are aligned with the decision or because there's something going on and there is a, a plan and implementation and there's a feeling of a management like i'm not sure how it is actually really happening so it's always in search of something and we make this very different thing we call it the three management waves are you actually at the beginning of something are you looking for input for a decision are you looking actually to test your decision robustness and alignment and engagement or are you actually finding out how well it's going and and for us these three things is really how we look every time at cases and that's the first thing what is the purpose of your event what is the purpose of your big dialogue what is the purpose of your meeting and uh so that is the one thing and you hear me talking it's that i do not believe that uh, I believe that what we bring is a capability to take better decisions, but you don't take decisions in a group anonymously. In a group anonymously, you actually bring forward the best insights that are there uh, in your organization or the team that is actually discussing. And these best insights are actually, can something be very harsh or not, or, or, or uh, and there are partly feedback and partly co-creation, but it's not an anonymous group that decides something in a company. It's, it's actually authority decision makers that take the responsibility and have often also a different context still around them. So we, uh, I find it, um, when we talk about <coughs> online crowds or dialogues, uh, we don't call it a decision tool, we call it a decision info tool. Um, and I think that's maybe where I want to start with uh, now. Fantastic. Uh, any comments on this, Steve? Yeah, I, I <clears throat> um, fully align. Mm. And I think one of the difficult discussions I've had with clients over the many years is uh, the instant reaction to proposing an anonymous way of working because their automatic assumption is that that would lead somehow to yeah. anarchy <laughs> and what, yeah. what we're trying to do is is uh, 
reveal all the perspectives, uh, the the angles of attack, the ideas, the in the room, uh, particularly when you're in a multi-agency environment or a multiple stakeholder environment, working with government on policy, where perhaps they they perceive that there are competitors in the room, so therefore they uh, yeah. say less or or nothing at all about their uh, approach to climate change or their yeah. their you know significant plans because they don't want to reveal to others. But actually, yeah. once you get people into that position, and Joanne, I completely agree that there are stages in the process where anonymity. Uh, is a fantastic tool, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that ideation section um, uh, period, uh, the process by which you're revealing what people really think, uh, the challenging, the discussing, the digging deeper into the ideas and the perspectives is where you can be helped by anony uh, anonymity. Mm -hmm. And many people don't need anonymity; they're perfectly willing to put their hand up and speak. And we allow that as well, of course. It's not just the technology. Yeah. And then there are processes. First, just to uh, there's a there's a definitive convergence process which you plan into your uh, event, your process, where you go through a series of criteria by which the best uh, decision outcome uh, is optimized by the group. Yeah. And when we talk about uh, good decisions, we're not talking about complete total consensus. We're talking about making high quality decisions based on the maximum amount of information that we can collate. Um, and I think putting that hierarchy back in is really, really important in the end, because there are certain people who become responsible for the uh, delivery of those outcomes. And you can't expect them to take this kind of, you know, anonymity uh, through that process, because of course, they're uh, their careers depend on them acting on those decisions. So putting that hierarchy back in at the end, I think, is a really important step as well. Yeah. Could I just pick up on... Sorry, Joanne, go ahead. No, I, I think there's uh, two things. And I, I take the example of one of our very earliest clients who, uh, who was a new CEO, and he said, I want to know what's going on in the company. I want to know what they think I should pick up. What are the yeah. big ticket items? And at the end, there were actually almost 12 big ticket items. And there were there was a differentiation. There were three which were dominant, but then, then quite a lot of others. And he went back in the meeting. And so the synthetron was used here in the preparation of an international meeting. So uh, he wanted to know what's going on so that he could prepare for the international meeting as a new CEO to present what he, uh, what he was thinking. And he clearly said, look, I listened to all this and I understand there's quite a lot over there. Um, these things I actually can take a decision on, and I'll tell you that's the way we're going. These things I really don't know, and we're going to have, uh, we're going to work on that. Uh, and these things, I feel that in my priority setting where we have to go, we have to put them in the fridge and let's put them in the fridge for the whole year. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what happened with that is also a kind of an ownership of the decision, Steve. That's what I wanted to yes. add. So yeah. by doing yeah. that, you also it's not an in, it's an input tool but it also gives like a robustness to the decision and acceptance of it so you, you kind of co-own it because you were part yeah. in 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 making it or contributing to it yeah agree i at, to the point where if you don't if you you started the discussion not agreeing with the eventual outcome or your perspective was very different you can at least buy into that decision as part of a management team or an organization because you've had the process fully transparently laid out in front of you and i think that's hugely important uh, and i think also the i just to reiterate your point i i think the obligation uh, that leaders have at the moment is uh, to provide the environment where the they can make the best decisions possible by maximizing the amount of collaboration and engagement that goes on. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the very single uh, worst thing that leaders talk to me about is that they are worried that people tell them what they think they want to hear yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. not what's actually happening in the organization on the ground. Yeah, and that's why the safe space can be so valuable because then Agreed. you really hear what's going on. And I also like, 
the, I remember when one client also was like a, a German client saying, oh, to, anonymity, I don't want that. And because uh, I think my people are stupid, they will say stupid things. And I was like, but then you have another problem. It's nothing to do with anonymity. <laughs> Okay. So it, it's it, there is uh, anonymity is creating a safe space, but fundamentally, I think leaders respect their people, yeah, and and it's part of that respect also that give, to give them that space and to listen. And um, there's an enormous value in being listened to. Huh? People say, "Oh, finally, I, I was you know in a big bank. I remember we did thousand people, but then I met at a totally different party." Drinking a glass is oh you from Sintotron. We hit it's the first time I felt that I had something to say in the company. It was a junior guy, but it was it's very nice to see that the ownership is there. Mm. Yeah. Sorry I interrupted you, Martin. No, 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 no. It's actually there's there's a there's a common thread between what, what both of you are saying there that I just wanted to to uh, inquire into, and that is that from, as you describe it, the meetings that you're referring to are surrounded by decision making and decision making processes is is that the only function that you see for meetings in the workflows within organizations well i i i wanted to expand on your uh, thinking about uh, workflow mm -hmm. and uh, what i see as another behavior that we've uh, managed successfully to upgrade or change over the last 18 months which is that uh, there, the organizations are in a constant state of analysis and, uh, you know, strategic and tactical thinking, you know, in parallel all the time. And uh, I have resisted for many years uh, this impulse to put everything into a single block of time and call it a meeting or an event and have that as the <laughs> optimum point in time where everybody can get together uh, everybody feels able and willing to say what they think and you come together and make a decision. I know that that's not possible. So I see these yeah. decision-making uh, uh, processes basically as the pulse of an organization. And that uh, uh, I have, I think Joanne was saying as well, very distinct phases. Uh, and one of the huge uh, benefits of the last 18 months, again, has been uh, people understanding and getting to grips with asynchronous working. So starting a process online and giving people time to think, to reflect, to question, to talk to their teams, to research, uh, to look into the data, to analyze, and then come together and, and you know, participate in this online process. And then you perhaps take a couple of decisions or you put a, a process together where you have to have people uh, because it's beneficial in a face-to-face -face environment, even you know, uh, online, virtual, face-to-face -face and also physical, of course. So that you can make those critical decisions based on the perspective that have been collected. And I see a post-intervention phase as well, which is equally important, where you can follow up, validate, check, yeah. confirm, uh, yeah. and then monitor the outcomes and the actions that have gone into the, uh, you know, that, that were made in the, the meeting. Um, and the almost the, I, I, call, I often call it ramp up and ramp down. So that the ramp down tails into the ramp up for the next in yep. input intervention. And that that's how I see organizations in terms of their pulse. Fantastic. It's, yeah. it's, it's incredible to see how the conversation flow with these uh, two guests that have a wealth of expertise. And just to explain to our viewers what we are here talking about is consultants or facilitators uh, that have a, a wealth of experience in using digital tools to get the most out of conversations and decision making uh, with uh, either large or small groups. I, I suppose, Joanne, you work normally with large groups like civic participations. No, okay, you will come from that. And same for you, Steve, like, like uh, both sides of groups. But, but uh, just to put this in, 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 a, in a perspective here, Martin, unless you have another question, let me just share here my, my, my screen on something that happened. Uh, it was, I mean, a birthday party here at home, my kid at uh, 18 years old, uh, where we are celebrating. But what's, what's interesting is that uh, this happened uh, suddenly within uh, WhatsApp. 
so nobody was able to send message. And I looked at the stock price of Facebook today, and it seems that they have lost a fortune, yeah. a fortune. Of course, that uh, if we consider that on top of this whistleblower, a lady that left uh, Facebook and is now uh, <laughs> talking to CNN and other news channels about the practices of the Facebook algorithm, I'm wondering what would uh, you know this uh, group decision making support system uh, um, benefit you know a company like Facebook. Uh, I remember that I was hired for, by Price Waterhouse Cooper Steve. I, I think you are also. We did this um, magnificent workshop on uh, risk prevention. Remember where we had all these um, massive amounts of themes. I think that Facebook is probably not doing their homeworks uh, correctly. Am I right or am I wrong? Interesting question. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I mean, I think- I, I think the analysis will take some time, but what what uh, what I was fascinated to hear this morning was that uh, they so fundamentally screwed up their infrastructure that they the people who are desperate to get into the office to fix it weren't even able to get through the card system. <laughs> so open doors. I mean, how? I mean, uh, we know that Facebook is uh, absolutely paranoid in terms of security you know for the officers but yeah being locked out your own office so you couldn't get to the system to uh, repair it (laughs) incredibly frustrating Uh, but i mean just on your point there paul the interesting thing that i'm picking out of the the news feeds just over the last 24 hours about the facebook scenario is the, the lady who came forward as the whistleblower who gave that cnn interview it appears from what she's saying and and the documentation that she's uh released that they had a whole lot of information, they had a whole lot of input, they had done a whole lot of consultation, engagement, et cetera. But it seems that somebody chose to ignore the inputs and the consultation in favor of the higher order of, well, we need to make money. Now I paraphrase because that's my understanding of what she has said. Um, but but is, isn't that an interesting potential threat to the concept of having meetings as consultative means to inform decision making. But then it begs the question, but what if those consultations go unheeded, go unlistened to, go unremarked? And and Steve, I'm I'm drawn to your your previous point there about the post the importance of the post intervention in this potential series of meetings to explain, to review, to rationalize, and then to set the foundation for the next series of interventions. So it becomes a rolling a rolling pattern of engagement and interactions, as opposed to these, we're having a meeting about X, we're having another meeting about Y, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, the, to me, that has to be fully integrated into the organization because uh, everything is dependent on everything else. Uh, yeah. you know, and uh, you, you know, you can't isolate a particular decision because you don't know the impact it will have on other areas yeah. of the business. Um, so going to, back to the Facebook, you know, we now know, and I think there's going to be much more uh, coming from this story in the next uh, couple of weeks, and perhaps more whistleblowers. Uh, but we know that they know definitively that their product is damaging sections of society, and particularly young people, and particularly women. So they are now culpable for that. And of course, they have now been shown to be, uh, you know, not flawless, as we thought, because they were pervasive and they, you know, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp, they were everywhere and they were completely integrated into uh, everybody's lives, particularly the young. Uh, And therefore, what other companies can you think about or industries where there is now evidence that they damage the well-being of their customers uh, and what happens. And perhaps, you know, even if you talk about, we're going off topic now, but the tobacco industry, uh, for decades it knew that it was killing its customers, but it was unable to, you know, face the reality of what needed to change. And I think it's going to be very similar for Facebook. Hmm. But doesn't doesn't that go back, Joanne, doesn't that go back to your point actually about you know, the anonymous contributors, uh, the possibility for people to give full, frank, 
open and honest contribution and then to have that heard um, with, without fear of retribution or engagement, is it, isn't that at the heart of, of the point that you previously made? Yeah, well, my, my word I, I use for this is respect. Yeah, and yeah. as long as long as there is no respect for your personnel, respect for your clients, respect for uh, certain fundamental values uh, which are part of your purpose, the whole thing falls down. Huh? So it's it comes down also, and and it, I gave this example, but going back to the flow, for example, I'm thinking about the transport company, uh, a big German transport company that actually where the CEO says, look, independent of I have my, my plans and going on every two, three months, I'm going to listen to people. Mm. And he yeah. just openly listens to them and said, and that's like from the floor, what's going on? What am I missing out on? And he does it with respect. So people are coming back. It's always three, 400 people that are there. And for him, it's an antenna. It's an input zone. But the fundamental, the, is he going to take a decision on every of these outcomes? No, but they are building the framework in which he's taking decisions. Um, and for me, the core in that is respect, and it's all the time. You can make whatever meetings, you can create whatever flow. If you do not respect the authors, if you do not respect the, the people that are actually creating all this content, you're not taking the decisions uh, with that wisdom in, in it. Huh? And I, I think if I listen to Facebook story without doing the details, there is a research that was done, they discovered something pretty nasty, but they didn't have the respect for the results. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. if you, and they didn't maybe mm. have the values strong enough, I think, mm. to, to th that's a fundamental thing in this. The values were not strong enough for this to be mm. an issue they would handle. And it's, yeah. they, they could start handle it in a small way, yeah? and it didn't need to be the CEO to handle it. That's the other thing. Yeah, if absolutely. the company had the values and the respect mentality, it would have handled it uh, by mitigating some things and trying to play with, with things uh, to, to influence it. So I think there's still something which is the DNA of a company, which is dominant in decision-making uh, processes and the flows that go underneath of it and the connection of both of them. Mm. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Martin, anything else you'd like to add? Because I have here something else to, to share with you all. Well, just, just one, uh, one, one thought. When uh, the, the academic research that, that I was engaged in myself a couple of years back to, to work on my PhD, uh, I was looking at meetings systemically. So as they integrate into the fabric of the organization, and three points came out of that in, in terms of how they connect both to each other and to the organization, other elements of the organization. One was people, two was objects, material, materiality, and three was processes. Um, and, I, and I just wondered if, if you had any thoughts on either or all of those uh, three components that connect meetings to each other as part of workflows within the organizations that, that bring more value than just individual meetings in their own right. So you have people, you have processes, the underlying processes associated with the meetings, and then you have the material aspects of whether it's agendas or briefing material or minutes or, or otherwise. Hmm. Good question. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, they, they are uh, the three fundamental elements in any good yeah. design. Yeah. And uh, yeah. to the point where I would uh, make sure that we were focusing as much time on those three elements, uh, you know, equally yeah. in, in order that you didn't bias it in a particular way. And the, that central core of the process or the where are we now, and where do we want to be, that definition of outcome or purpose or vision for where we're trying to go, even if it's just six people working on a learning review from a project you know so it could be micro and it could be very macro it could be the uh, strategy from uh, a new organization that's just been formed by the merger of, of two organizations so some mm -hmm. fundamental shifts it could be that macro and getting the right people involved getting the right people in the right frame of mind uh, to uh, contribute to engage is hugely important so how we do that and how we build that in is hugely important 
Um, and then the skill, I think the, uh, the, 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 the package of skills that we bring as uh, event designers and facilitators is the tools and the yeah. steps and the process steps. So, so that's where our expertise is. Uh, and quite often I find myself in uh, some quite difficult conversations with uh, leaders in organizations who have a very traditional idea about what needs to happen in this event. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of persuade them to think about it in a different way, trying to uh, get them to ask more questions uh, in the intervention, trying to get them to open up to uh, a different kind of uh, input or discussion from people. Mm -hmm rather than you know so break the mold and shake it up a bit and change the energy uh, mm -hmm. and use different techniques and anonymity and collaboration technology and uh, asynchronicity to try and mix it up a bit and that's all in the design so hugely yeah. important those three elements uh, absolutely and and before uh, giving the floor to you joan because you are simply uh, you have to let me just share you something uh, martin that can clarify a little bit of what you are just uh, uh, talking about, you know, the meetings as part of your organizational flow. This is a, a very interesting resource from uh, Lucid Meetings. Yeah. Least, uh, we all know her, right? She, yeah. she produced this document, which is uh, quite interesting, as I, I would imagine that uh, today uh, at Facebook, they will be probably uh, <laughs> addressing this kind of red, uh, red colored meeting types here, research resolution. But uh, what I fear is that the reason why you reach this stage is because in the first place, you do not prepare your organization at problem solving level, at perhaps even workshops, decision making. I would like to hear from you on how, what would be the benefits of uh, using uh, your type of services in order to prevent an organization to reach this point of issue resolution, which nobody wants, and it's extremely costly. Um, I think it's, it's using crowdsourced dialogues um, is actually a way to uh, reinforce or mold a certain culture. And I, I fundamentally think that when we talk about the case we were talking about, that it's the, um, the ownership of the issue, which is, which is, which is the, the real problem. And somewhere there was... Uh, a research and it was very nasty results but the ownership was never picked up now that is actually you, you can have meetings around that uh, and you can present it and maybe influence people but i think fundamentally it 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 requires people to respect data respect these insights uh now if i think back on on a crowdsource that you could have had a real uh, big dialogue where maybe people would have gone to their personal values and not the corporate values and probably and that we see that quite a lot that probably there is a sense of urgency which is very different than the one which the meta system actually allows you to have so in that sense creating a safe space to speak up for everyone could have done the difference that suddenly it was not a few people and a lady trying to bang them everyone's door, but it was actually recognized something where the fundamental DNA of all the people working there was actually saying, hey, we, we should care for this. Uh, that is not happening because of a, a stronger dominant culture, which is just killing it. Now, in a, providing a safe space to speak up actually does that. It does allow to really find out that there is something which is actually at the high, it should be picked up at the high level. But the other thing is that while I always say you with online dialogues which are anonymous, you're not making decisions, you are actually making uh, priorities. You're putting something on the table. And so it is up to the decision maker to say yes or no, maybe. But if he says no, he knows that 80 percent or he, she, but in this case, he, he knows that 80% of the people are actually thinking differently. It's pretty harsh as a CEO to do that. You have to be very much aware of what you're doing then, and you have to be able to explain it because people think fundamentally different. So it's not a decision-making, but it is there as a new fact, 
and the new fact needs to be de dealt with in that way it influences decision much more than just input uh, okay. I, i'm not sure so, I'm theoretically here yeah. but uh, so for, for not for Facebook because Facebook now is facing you know the, the, the next day the day after, but for all other organizations uh, creating safe spaces and creating a safe culture where people can have their values expressed is extremely important. And these tools definitely this, this digital facilitation can help you to do that at a major scale because normally people are afraid. How can you create a safe space in in a company the size of Facebook? Yes, it's possible, right, Steve? Yeah, I, I, I think it should be Facebook because I think it's such a brilliant example of, uh, of uh, how clear the next step should be. Uh, and I think, uh, to me, there are two very distinct uh, process steps. And uh, this is absolutely enhanced your original question about uh, the influence of an external, independent, uh, non-stakeholder party like us to help manage that process because uh, fundamentally we can ask the difficult questions we can ask the impertinent questions <clears throat> what happened and why and so on and the two process steps are first of all focus entirely on what happened the factual timeline the steps what actually happened without any opinion without any uh, potential uh, focus on who screwed up because as soon as you get into that you've lost the plot so you keep and you factually record what happened what are the salient uh, points in the timeline uh, that led to this incident once you're you agree collaboratively that you've got all the information in one place you then go into step two which is so what so what do we do about this? How do we stop it happening again? What do we learn from it? And the learning has to be, um, what are the processes we need to change? And quite often processes appear to work, but they're masked by people taking shortcuts and not doing the full process. So you need to examine that. You need to look at the technology, what you have, the tools that you're using in order to uh, follow those processes. And then specifically, you need to look at the behaviors yeah. uh, and perhaps even look at the culture. And of course, we know that culture is effectively the manifestation of the behaviors. Yeah. And senior leadership behavior is, of course, the most influential on the culture. So if you look across that and you look at really pragmatic, realistic outcomes, learning outcomes, then you can ensure that this manifestation of what happened will never happen again and all the elements that uh, we've been talking about uh, an open and transparent environment the ability for people to think and reflect and research what happened uh, and to speak openly using anonymity if that triggers it uh, helps people get to the point where they understand what happened and can make meaningful uh, collaborative uh outcomes and learning suggestions about what can be done pragmatically in the organization to avoid it happening again that would be my process absolutely martin over to you for the conclusion so far yeah just uh it, it's would it be would it be fair to say if i could just ask a kind of a, a wrap-up question would it be fair to say in light of what you've said over the last 35 odd minutes that are our meetings as a resource within the organizations, are they being underutilized? Are, are we not getting the best value that we could out of them to inform decisions, to inform outcomes, to actually act as learning arena and so on? I, I, I think it's a big, big question, uh, and it goes back to what's the purpose of the meeting. Um, yeah. the, and the purpose of the meeting is, is, is manifold. Yeah? It is an, a part of uh, what, what one of our clients called totem parties. It's a part of being part of the clan uh, and, and belonging yeah. and having fun and things like that. Yeah? That's, that's, and that's a very important part of a physical meeting. Now, if I talk online meetings, it's 
part of being able to contribute to, to feel like hey I'm, I'm i'm i actually count i can actually the other part is the learning part eh? is the whole interaction by which you get wiser and you get new materials and you get them. It's the whole learning part uh which can be more effective or less effective uh, and then there is the decision part i feel that meetings are hardly decision moments the decisions are taken often before the meeting and it's implementation yeah. decisions that are taken at meetings um and that's okay as long as the decision before the meeting has had all the necessary input and is able to actually align huh? so what are you doing most at meetings is alignment and translating into what it takes to happen which are also decisions but a lower level type of decision and i think yeah it depends on how they organize it depends on but it depends very much on the agenda uh to 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 make a comment on this and i i feel that if the agenda is right and the processes are right it works huh? uh the anonymous online what we do now more and more it's very interesting is that we just have another big telecom client and, where people actually say, well, I have these online meetings. And what is happening in online meetings that, yes, you can actually vote or you can act a little hand up or you can, but the massive online meetings are actually boring listening, most of them. Yeah? So what is happening now that we have a totally new business starting, which is that we are used for 20 minutes feedback, 20 minutes for creation, 20, we just had um, fashion designers. 20 minutes thinking about you know what is the biggest bottleneck we have to go to green fashion huh? and then 20 minutes thinking like okay and and what is it that we can actually do to make that happen huh? and what, how, what can i do and what i expect from this organization to do and things like that so you you suddenly get uh in today's world where things have become more online that probably that interactive stuff which is co-creation and things like that is is starting to be missed uh, and so if you compare the physical meetings with the part of interaction was dominantly big value and an objective, the online meetings have that far less. You can have your workout groups, you can break out groups, you can, can, can go on a whiteboard. But the fundamental mass interaction is actually something where more and more we are uh, being useful for something we were not designed for. But it's very nice to see that that is actually uh, really working well. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Steve, I mean, I, I, yeah, just uh, I, I get my initial thought uh, is that I try and avoid the the word meeting as much as possible, because <laughs> even to me, who who has been in meetings my entire life, I've made it my profession. Uh, they yeah. still feel nineteenth century to me. They still, uh, <laughs> you know, conjure up. Uh, you know, kind of council meetings with uh, agendas. And as Joanne said, where all the decisions are made before you go in there and they're just going through the motions. So so I want to eradicate this word from our lexicon. <laughs> I want to, and, and I think also the uh, enormity of the potential that we've now got with technology. So many organisations have broken this stranglehold they had from email. Uh, and they're using platform tools, Slack and Monday.com and uh, MS Teams and uh, so on yeah. to to really allow the uh, productive collaboration that you're talking about, Martin, the pulse of yeah. the organization, how decisions are identified and researched and then brought together to 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 uh, to align, uh, I think is happening in many, many different ways now, whereas we imagine they're happening in meetings but they're really not so we talk about collaborative processes we talk about session or sessions we talk yeah. about briefings you know if there's a a broadcast meeting then podcast it and send it out on email as a link or put it on your slack you know don't have people sit there and listen to yeah. the ceo's presentation for 35 minutes find different ways of doing it think creatively about it um and uh, create the space where you can get people together saying you know face to face in a virtual or an online uh, environment as well as face to face 
uh, to make those critical decisions based on the collaborative information that has been collated to, uh, beforehand. So you're making, you know, you're making effort in identifying the points in time when you do need people to actually work together and bounce ideas off each other and what else can be done outside of those expensive, difficult to arrange productive sessions. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's what uh, that's the picture I, sh I chose for this uh, broadcast, right? The yeah. old way and the new way where we have um, a series of uh, events, collaborative events where teams and uh, stakeholders can get together and uh, be more productive in the end, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, I, I think, Steve, your, your final comments there provides a useful segue. Just if, if I was to, to just capture a, a number of the key ideas that we've just discussed over the, the last 40 odd minutes, um, like our, our theme meetings as part of your organization's workflow, um, it, it might actually, you, you could almost flip that expression on its head from, from our conversation. You could say, well, it's the organization workflow as part of your meetings. <laughs> Which, yeah. which then means that the meetings themselves have, have no particular boundaries, which, which now conjures up the concept in my mind anyway, of having open, ongoing, collaborative interactions with people rather than discrete meeting events. And, and that provides then the possibilities for some of the things that we talked about, which was you know the idea of anonymous contribution so that people can speak openly, speak frankly, can have their voice heard. We've talked about informed decision making by the powers that be so how they choose to do that there are multiple different channels it doesn't just have to be chalk and talk at the annual or at the, the, the weekly meeting or the weekly update from the ceo or there are multiple ways to have that type of interaction so the decisions are well informed we also then brought in steve i think you brought in the concept then of after meeting events so that, so that we have follow-ups to explain rationales, to explain reasoning, and then to lay the groundwork for the next series of engagements, interactions. Underpinning all of that, I think, is, Joanna, a key point that you made, which really should infuse the whole thing, is respect. It's respect for people, respect for process, respect for okay. all inputs on, a, on an equal footing, um, and still respecting that decision makers still have to come up with final decisions. They have responsibilities, uh, answerable to shareholders, answerable to owners, answerable to actually the people that, that work for them. Um, and like I, I introduced the concept of the connectors between our different events uh, and between our, work, our workflows and process, the people, the processes and the materials. Um, we we kind of segued into Facebook and we almost took it like a, a kind of a case study of well, if things are going wrong right now in the moment, which, which they seem to be for Facebook in a fairly heavy way, uh, we then talked very briefly about, so, so what might we focus on? Steve, just two key points you made there was facts. Just, just establish the facts of whatever it is that happened in your organization. And then to look at the so what, a key part of which is, so what do we take away from this? How do we prevent the, the negative or adverse happening again? And, and how do we carry out or what remedial actions can we take to put things right? Um, so that's a bit of a whirlwind stop of a really engaging and interesting conversation, guys, from, from, uh, from your respective um, backgrounds. Paul, I'll hand back to you. Fantastic. Oh, well, we couldn't have a better summary, Martin. It's, uh, it's great. Your synthesizing power is amazing. Okay, guys, so thank you so much, uh, dear viewers, for sticking with us. We don't want to keep you uh, until the hour because otherwise the, the ones who are not watching us live would uh, not be watching this uh, uh, replay uh, later on. Uh, golden nugget uh, from these conversations so far for, uh, I'm starting, uh, the, the, re the key point really for me is safe spaces and co-creation. That's the two nuggets that I take from this conversation. Respect is my one from Joanne. That that for me is is a fun, an absolute fundamental. That's really important. I think. Mm. I I, th I think for me it's just uh, mix it up, change change the language. <laughs> think you know, think fresh and different yeah. and new. Don't be bound by uh, any concepts or uh, traditions. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 
for me, I think I go back to your uh, people, objectives and processes. I think we underestimate the objective, the, the material, which is often like a, a resolution or a report or a, an action list. And I think that is actually is, is the ultimate often result of a meeting uh, and yeah. the process and is too, too much too often deluded or no, not living uh, very much. So I think if there's one thing I, I feel that we in this equation didn't talk about, but which is very important, uh, and which you mentioned is actually you know, what is the result of the meeting uh, and what is happening to that, which is uh, a respect of having spent time together and, and doing something about it. Absolutely. I hope that the result of this conversation was useful for all new viewers here. And uh, let's hope that we uh, keep in touch for uh, next events happening in October and November. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Joanne, Steve, for uh, attending this uh, studio. And Martin, thank you so much for your synthesizing power and facilitation. Thank you all. No trouble. Thanks, guys. Great to meet you. Good to meet you guys. Thank you.